Hi, you guys, and so good to be back. I um, I was actually I'm actually looking forward to this live today because I was away for three weeks and two and a half weeks. And, um, and last last week was um, I was talking to a doctor about Graves' disease, and so that wasn't really like um, you know one to one with you, if you will. And so I'm excited to uh, to be back. I posted my results on. If you if you follow the page on Facebook or on our Thrivers, our closed group, I posted the results of my HRV, which stands for heart rate variability. And gosh, what a difference it made just to be in nature amongst people that I really like and doing things that I love, which is botany, plants, herbalism. I was at a botanical and foraging course for two weeks and we were camping out in Montana. We crossed over to Idaho. Uh, for those of you who are in Idaho, I'm totally jealous you live there because I think it's just such a lovely and underestimated, underdiscovered place for now. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was really amazing just to see how um, lush it is, and with so much of you know fishiness in the water, and and uh, just undiscovered places, and still a lot of camp spots available. So. Yeah, so I had an amazing break, and um, you know, one of the things you will see in the post that I made was my HRV, how much has changed from my baseline of 22 and up all the way up to 49 within just literally five days of being out camping and and just being surrounded by nature and just like I said, doing the things that I really love. So just um, HRV for those of you who are not familiar um, is it stands for heart rate variability. It's a it's an indicator, it's a marker that it's more used um, often, more and more often used by professional athletes. By um, I was actually talking to a friend of mine, Dr. Anna Kebeka, last night. Uh, she's an OBGYN. OBGYNs use that as well to monitor health of a baby. It shows you the status of your um, ANS, or your automatic nervous system, which is your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So that's your flight and fly versus fight and flight versus your rest, relax and digest uh, part of your system, which, you know, there's so much research that shows that um, depending on how um, good is your HRV, uh, that's, that's been linked now to chronic inflammation, a lot of different chronic diseases, autoimmunity. Um, the health of your immune system has even been linked to cancers. And so a really great one to, to monitor. And I'm using the Aura Ring for, for that. I don't have a discount. We are not an affiliate partner for them. So you can just go to AuraRing.com and, and check them out. Um, but this is just a marker that I think is so important for us to measure. And, you know, and it's funny because my HRV went up, like I said, from 22 to 49 within five days of being in the camp. And it was on the 3rd of July. And then when I looked at my results on the 4th of July, because of, the, because of the silly fireworks and where we were was, there were a lot of them and very loud and very unnecessary. I felt it was like, it was almost like a war zone. Didn't sleep well that night. And of course my um, HRV dropped significantly to like 32 uh, that night. So it kind of tells you when you were stressed out and, um, and a little angry <laughs> that your sleep is getting compromised, your HRV can suffer. Anyway, today I want to talk about energy. So how do you naturally boost your energy levels? And, you know, for sure, certainly uh, many of you might feel like your energy levels increase when you go on vacation, but you also may notice that they don't increase and something isn't quite right. And so that will be something I want to explore with you today uh, because things like, for example, eating a lot of sugar can also drain your energy levels in a big way. So let's talk about um, what these are. And maybe the first one that I want to start off with is, you know, since you're here, we are hormones balanced. So hormones, your hormones can play a huge role in how your energy manifests. And so I think the first hormonal uh, imbalance that I want to talk about that has a profound impact on your energy levels that's highly misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed are the thyroid conditions. So hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's, very dear to my heart because I, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's in 2008. And um, as much as I am in remission, it does come back if I do stupid things, um, you know, like going, um, I'm stressed out and I eat the wrong foods and I travel somewhere where I just, you know, I don't eat the way I eat at home. And so it does come back. But on the most part is under control and I'm, on, I'm not on any thyroid medications. You know, I think thyroid fatigue is different from any other uh, fatigue. And the reason why I say that is because 
if you feel, you know, like it's, it's one thing to be feel tired at the end of the day. It's another story when you are feeling so depleted, like life has just been sucked out of you and there is nothing left. You're just going on empty. And so that's, and that's how thyroid can often feel. Um, so energy loss, and especially if you couple that up with a few other symptoms, such as suddenly your hair starts falling out, you start putting on weight for no good reason, anxiety and depression um, find their way in, your one third of your eyebrows start falling out, you're, you're beginning to see eyelashes like, you know, on your cheek every day instead of, you know, just once in a while. Um, those are some of the, oh, your nails start getting really brittle and start breaking really easily. Um, those are some of the symptoms of hypothyroidism. And the, the uh, one of the reasons why it is so vastly undiagnosed and underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, is because the medical professions do not, the conventional doctors do not run a complete set of tests. So if you suspect, based on the symptoms I just mentioned, that you might be having a thyroid problem, it is paramount for you to test not just a TSH and T4, which is most what doctors do. And just to give you an example, like my TSH and T4 were in a perfect shape. Um, it's my antibodies that were super high. So for that reason, there's a few markers you wanna test for. The first one is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. They will do that um, for you without you having to ask for it. The other one is T4. I think it's good to do, especially free T4, not a total T4. The other one is a free T3. That's your working horse. That's the that's the hormone that um, the the thyroid hormone that actually gets converted from T4 to T3 in your gut and your liver, and that's what your receptors are have like in your hair follicles. That's what turns fat into energy. That's your T3. It gives you beautiful skin, sharp mental functions. By the way, by the way, brain fog, forgetfulness is another symptom of potentially of um, of having a thyroid problem. So. T3 is the working horse. So measuring that is really, really important. A lot of women have a good T4, but when they measure their free T3, it tends to be on the low side, way too low. And that's the reason why they can't function. Another one would be, um, so those are your thyroid markers. And then what's also really important is for you to test your antibodies. And so those will be, and Alexandra, if we can post those uh, really important to antibodies, TPO, that stands for thyroid peroxidase antibody. So TPO and anti-TG antibodies. Uh, TG stands for thyroid globulin antibodies. Those two antibodies will rule out or confirm if you have Hashimoto's disease or um, oftentimes the, the, the anti-TG antibodies will show you that you might be having thyroid nodules, even thyroid cancer. And they also are a marker for estrogen dominance, a really great one too. Now, a lot of doctors don't wanna test this for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and I'm not gonna go into that. You're gonna find a practitioner who would do that. And many of them would, if you just fight and argue. You can also go and order the test yourself. And we have a website for you. It's on, um, you can go to yourlabwork.com slash hormones balance, uh, yourlabwork.com. Alexandra, we can put that on, uh, because people are gonna be asking yourlabwork.com slash hormones balance. Uh, that's our page that was prepared for you guys, and you can order your lab test there without having to argue or beg your doctor. So thyroid, really important to rule out. Um, many people say I have thyroid uh, issue, but I don't have Hashimoto's. Don't say that unless you test for the antibodies. Um, one of the things that is um, also really important, a lot of people think that if I have a low thyroid function, the first thing I'm going to do is going to go and load up on iodine, which is one of the worst things you can ever do. Um, I'm in the midst of reading right now Dr. Alan Christensen's book called The, um, uh, the uh, a Thyroid Reset Diet. And he's, he's basically it's a low iodine diet, really, really interesting approach. And he talks about there that there are practitioners who put people on high iodine. And the problem with that is that um, it actually shuts down the thyroid function. It's a, let's put it this way, iodine, as he names it, I think it's just a spot on description. It's a narrow safety um, um, trace metal, okay? Narrow safety means that the safety is very narrow, right? So you need it to function, but just a little bit too much is going to flip you over to a point of being dangerous. And I've seen this many times when I was in private practice where women were put on iodine, 
by their doctor, their practitioner, and with very poor results. Um, and a lot of times it feels good at the beginning because you are maybe iodine deficient and after that is they come crushing. Um, I've had a woman who I worked with uh, who couldn't get out of bed for three months because of an iodine overdose. The other thing is happens if you have Hashimoto's antibodies elevated below above 100, um, taking iodine is going to skyrocket those iodine, uh, those uh, antibodies even higher, causing even a more aggressive attack on the thyroid. Uh, and there is actually research papers to that. One of the things that Dr. Alan Christensen cites, and by the way, I'm going to have him invite him as a speaker to speak with us because I think the book is really fascinating. And, and I think there's been so much of damage done to the whole thyroid treatment plan, even in functional medicine. Um, just throwing iodine at women without any concern for the dose and the length of the duration that we should be dosing. Um, so, yeah, so this is um, so this is one word of precaution. Please be very careful with iodine. Um, and if you, um, the other thing that he talks about, which is fascinating, I'll just share with you, is that the, <clears throat> when you take high doses of iodine, and this is we are talking about anything more than 50 micrograms a day the receptors in a body for thyroid overall start shutting down. And that's when the women up their dose of their thyroid medication, but the thyroid medication isn't working because the receptors are just not open to receiving the thyroid hormone. Um, just a quick, like a, a, a you know, physiological and anatomical explanation here. The way hormones work is that these little messengers that get produced in the glands, they go into a bloodstream and then the blood distributes them to the various receptors in the body. So for example, for iodine, we have receptors in the thyroid, in the breast, in the brain, in the ovaries. The thyroid is by far the, the most hungry for iodine. Okay, so um, so then, um, so iodine is actually not produced. So hormones is the same thing. So thyroid also gets produced, for example, in the thyroid uh, gland. It gets distributed to different parts of the body, like your follicles, like your fat cells, like your mitochondria like your um, nails, hair, et cetera, uh, for you to function properly. Um, the, the problem starts is that when you have high doses of iodine, those receptors shut down. And so the door is basically closed from the thyroid hormone coming through and doing its work. And so really, really um, quite a dangerous substance, especially on high doses and working with someone who really is skilled in that is paramount. So that's about the thyroid. Um, let me take a quick look at the comments. And um, Alexandra, are we able to um, post some of the comments for me to answer them? Um, so my TGB came back high, 32.2. That's not too high, but all the other markers are normal. What does that mean? So Daniela, you're going to look at your um, symptoms as well. Like, are you, do you have estrogen dominance? It's also worthwhile doing a sonogram on your, th on your thyroid just to confirm or rule out that you don't have any thyroid nodules. Uh, to be honest with you, that the, the TGB B32 is actually not super high, uh, it's just slightly elevated, but it's also good to remember that, you know, if it's slightly elevated, you wanna definitely bring them down and something to be just aware of. Uh, Shannon is saying, I had all the tests, you mentioned everything was good, but my progesterone was 0.1 and estradiol was below 10, trying to see uh, what to take naturally yeah so we'll come back to uh to two questions on other hormones in just a second um okay so he's a darcy saying my tpo was 1858 yeah so that's very high when first diagnosed five years ago now it's 241 so congratulations darcy and if you could share with us what have you done to to bring down your antibodies um i was at i was at about the same and and the um and mine dropped to like, I think the lowest I was at was 67. So still an active Hashimoto's, but coming from, you know, the upper thousands to down to 67 felt like a really good um, progress. And most importantly, what you wanna look for apart from numbers is also how you feel. What's your energy like? How is your hair uh, loss? How is the health of your nails? Your, you know, your sharpness, how sharp are you? Uh, bloating is another one, right? With thyroid constipation, a lot of women who are constipated um, can also be uh, having, that's because of thyroid. So Darcy's saying diet change, no gluten, no dairy, no, low sugar. Yay! That's our kind of girl. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, somebody, I think this is from, is saying TPO 90, um, so below 100, not very, 
not very bad. Um, yeah, so this is um, is a good question. Um, looking by numbers is not too bad, but you also have to look at your symptoms, okay? Meaning that, you know, how are you with the symptoms that I just talked about, right? If your symptoms, if you're highly symptomatic and it's pointing towards the thyroid, uh, then and then then you know then something is to be said for that. The other thing you want to also look at. Sorry, I can't see your name. It just shows me as Facebook user. Um, the other thing you want to consider is looking at your free T3, your t total T4, uh, free T4. Look at those markers too, uh, to just to understand. Yeah. Okay. Um, so why don't we just move on to the other hormonal imbalances? There's a lot of other things I want to talk about. I did spend quite a bit on thyroid because I feel like the thyroid is, amongst all the hormonal um, conditions, I feel like that's the number one uh, 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 hormonal imbalance that really, really steals your energy. So the second one is, you know, what a lot of people refer to as adrenal fatigue. Um, it's it's a term that a lot of practitioners are going away from because the adrenals actually aren't really fatigued, is the whole HPA axis that gets dysregulated. So HPA axis is basically your hormones that get produced in inside your, your hypothalamus, and then it goes into your pituitary gland, and then from the pituitary, that gets passed on to the adrenals. So it's not the adrenals that actually are exhausted. Uh, the other thing that adrenal, you know, a lot of times it's called adrenal fatigue, but it's actually mitochondrial dysfunction that is also happening. So a little bit more complex, but just for the purpose of presenting this and talking about the adrenal function um, is, you know, this just, I, I feel like that's a really can be a complicated one to fix, but at the same time, it's going to be completely life-changing when you address it. To repair adrenal function or HPA access or to, um, revive your mitochondrial function there isn't one supplement one you know i'm going to talk about later about magnesium malate and b vitamins and um some you know some um uh, herbs that can really adaptogenic herbs that can really help you but what i found is that if you have let's just say unresolved trauma from the past if you are dealing with current constant stress um you know because of having a horrible job or COVID has created just a lot of, you know, turmoil in your life. You are in toxic relationships um, that can be potentially draining you. And all of that can really feed into your adrenal function. Um, poor diet, diet that is full of sugar, poor sleep, you know, looking at your phone, you know, being on your iPhone, on your iPad um, until, until very late at night and then blue light just totally killing your melatonin production, right? All of this can really be um, hugely detrimental for your adrenals. So the thing with the adrenals is that it isn't one supplement. It isn't one, um, you know, one thing, one diet change that you need to do. There's actually quite a whole collection of things that you need to change around your life in order to basically reduce and eliminate those energy suckers. Um, and, you know, it can be really hard. Some people don't want to go into therapy and address, you know, crap from the past. Some people you know, are scared to walk around from a toxic relationship. And and I know it might not sound like it's, you know, because you know me as a hormones person, I was like, tell me what's the diet, what's the supplement, but I'll be very limited in my approach or misleading you to think that there's only a supplement or a diet that's going to save your adrenals. It's not. Um, there's some really great books and resources on that. We had Demi Silver coming and talking with us um, three weeks ago, a month ago, that we talked about, you know, um, betrayal and just the emotional stuff. And she talked about like how people who deal with uh, betrayal and emotional trauma, how their health transforms as a result of resolving that trauma. There's also some great books like You Are the Placebo and When the Body Says No. So I do recommend for you to look at these resources if, you know, if especially, um, I mean, I think starting with a diet is always a good idea, right? Because that's really fundamental. It's something that you do day in, day out, um, it's what nourishes your body or depletes your body, right? So elimination of alcohol, caffeine, right? Really having a high nutrient diet, uh, having a quality sleep is already going to put you in a really good place to start healing. And then start working on the other things like the emotional uh, side of things, the toxicity of your relationships, like what drains you, what, what doesn't nourish you needs to go. It's really as simple as that, but it's so difficult to do for a lot of people. So that's your adrenal function. Um, let's see what, uh, then we also have the other one um, and we have an article about this. So you, we're gonna post this, um, Alexandra, if you can post the article URL, 
in the comments. Um, the other hormonal imbalance that is huge when it comes to your energy levels is your blood sugar imbalances. And so, you know, how many of you here can relate when I say you had a certain type of breakfast, right? And you feel really tired after having breakfast. I mean, I think the classical one, when you go out on Sunday morning and you see people having like a steak of, of um, pancakes like this, and then they pour this fake uh, maple syrup on top, right? And then have some like, you know, three strawberries, right? And then they have grapefruit juice with coffee, right? Um, and then two hours later, mimosa, right? That's another one that a lot of people like to have with on the Sunday breakfast, just to get a bit of um, of a kick on a, on a Sunday morning from a mimosa. And so when you really look at all of this, I mean, all of that food is just a perfect bomb, sugar bomb. You're setting yourself up for a complete disaster for the rest of the day. And so you know, if you have ever done that, I've done pancakes before, but not like that. It was just like one or two pancakes. Even that, I feel tired soon after and I'm ready for a nap. So blood sugar imbalances can be a, a huge sugar suck. And, you know, maybe on the weekend, you don't really care about being energetic and sharp and, and upbeat. But during the week, you know, when you have a breakfast like that, that's full of carbohydrates, um, it, you know, you're kind of setting yourself for a disaster rate later in the day. And that's when we go to coffee after coffee, then we need more sugar in order to bring up our blood sugar levels, right? You know, we did a challenge about, uh, like, I, I want to say six months ago, and we challenged you guys to do different kinds of breakfast. And so like one day you do a smoothie, another day you do fasting, another day you do like, you know, a fruit smoothie. Um, so actually the smoothies was a fruit smoothie. There was another smoothie that was a vegetable, a veggie smoothie. So there was no sugar in it. Then we challenged you to doing like a pancake, sort of a toast uh, with jam on top, kind of a breakfast, right? And then we challenged you to do like a PFF kind of breakfast, protein, fat and fiber kind of breakfast that doesn't contain any sugar. And the consensus was, um, so, so I think we ran it for seven days and we asked her to keep a journal and people were writing down, like, how do you feel after each breakfast? And the fascinating thing that came out from that was that anything that contained sugar was hugely energy sucking. Um, people felt the best when they either fasted and, the, and again, fasting is not for, for everyone. Uh, but if you feel good fasting, the sweet spot is about 14 to 16 hours is your fasting window. The easiest thing I find to do when it comes to fasting is that you have really early dinner, like five o'clock, and then you don't eat until 11 a.m. the next morning and and or 10 or 11 o'clock. And that gives you about 15, 16 hours of, of fasting. So and it's I, I find it easier to do than having dinner at eight o'clock and then not eating until one or two p.m. For me, that's too late. I don't feel good. My blood sugar levels start dropping. I start getting tired. I, I'm starting to reach. I start reaching out for caffeine. So. Um, so some people felt great fasting. Um, so fasting was was the energy booster. Um, women who did the smoothie that was um, vegetable based did felt really well. And then women who did the PFF kind of breakfast, protein, fat, and fiber um, kind of um, you know kind of breakfast felt the best as well. The worst ones were the ones that they did basically fruit for breakfast. So. You know, a lot of people, um, actually when we do job applications, one of the things that we ask is like, what do you eat for breakfast? And it's just more of a curiosity question really. Um, but it's, it also tells me a little bit about how much that person knows about health. And, you know, as you know, I try to hire women who are really interested in this space, who are very knowledgeable so they can support you, support our community in a, in a knowledge, from a place of knowledge and, and um, of course empathy, but knowledge too. So, you know, when I ask about a question and when somebody puts their, their favorite and best breakfast they've had is a bowl of um, like rice crisps or uh, doing oatmeal with, with uh, uh, you know, bananas and, and whatever, pineapple on top. Like for me, that's, that's the end of the interview, <laughs> you know, uh, because it's just a sugar bump. Um, it's a sugar bump, but it's also a carbohydrate loading. So what's going to happen is you're going to spike up your blood sugar levels. After that, you're going to come down crashing. And when you come down crashing, that's the, that's the point that's going to absolutely exhaust you. And that's why you're feeling tired after sugar your breakfast. Who here has noticed the difference? If you follow us for a while, you may be very well aware of uh, the kind of breakfast that I, um, I promote very heavily, which is the high in protein, fat, and fiber eating your dinner leftovers, making, you know, breakfasts that are savory um, and, and not sweet. 
Um, how many of you here have tried it and actually feel like, you know what, like this feels actually a lot better than doing my smoothie that had all that banana and pineapple and mango in it. And it was kind of a sugar bump. So um, do share if you if that's part of your story, too. So blood sugar balance, you know, is because it's insulin and the insulin is produced by the pancreas. That's why we talk about it in the umbrella of our of, of sugar balance. Um, in the article, you will see what is the healthy fasting glucose levels and healthy H1AC that a person should have. Uh, what the labs give you um, is actually the same thing. Story with hormone with thyroid hormone is that. The, the interpretation of the labs, the ranges are too wide. It's not for healthy people. You've got to look at the functional ranges. And so, and we've mentioned all of them in the article that's posted here. So your fasting glucose should be below th um, 90 um, is, um, and, not, um, and not be up to 99, the way doctors will tell you. Only then they will declare you pre-diabetic, diabetic. diabetic. Uh, HA1C, we like to see it at 5.4 and not over 5.6. Um, and insulin, we are looking at below 15, um, where conventional doctors will say it's 25. So as you can see, it's a lot more rigid. Okay, so let's talk a little bit um, about, um, you know, about diet changes. Like what can you change in your diet and what you're drinking, what you're eating for breakfast and throughout the day in order to really get great results. And I'm just going to have a quick sip of my drink who wants to guess what i'm drinking it's green mm. chris is saying um pff or um can we just yeah uh pff or fasting for breakfast makes me feel great yeah thanks chris who wants to guess so what am i drinking it is slightly caffeinated it is caffeinated um and um but it's not coffee. It's very nice and green. Who wants to guess when I'm drinking? Spinach. No, I'm not drinking spinach. Urgh. Spinach is not caffeinated. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Um, maca. It's not maca. It's close. Name is close, but it's not. Rose got it right. Yes, I'm drinking matcha. Thank you. All right. So let's move on to, um, you know, what can you do with your, with your food in order to increase your energy levels? And so the... Um, yeah, so you know, I, like I mentioned just now, having having your uh, changing your breakfast around to something either fasting or doing um, or doing PFF kind of breakfast is a really great idea. So a lot of people are kind of confused about what can you eat and what can I eat for breakfast that's got protein, fat, and fiber, right? So I want to give you a couple of ideas um, and. Um, and, and, and so if you have my latest book, Overcoming Estrogen Dominance, uh, most of the breakfast here are actually savory. Um, we only had like one or two very low sugar. And so think of it this way, you know, and like for example, this weekend, I make this recipe here, which is waffles. And so these waffles are don't have any sugar. Um, and instead we're using kale and, uh, and uh, salmon, smoked salmon in order to put that on top instead of using um, a lot of sweet stuff. Another example of a smoothie, for example, is a smoothie that contains um, that's called the avocado sprouted uh, sprout smoothie that just uses uh, vegetables. This is the farmer's wife's breakfast that I was telling you about. The farmer's wife's breakfast is basically about having some animal protein here, having a whole bunch of greens. I'm using arugula here, having an avocado for fats, having um, a bit of sauerkraut as your source of probiotic. And um, we use, you know, um, uh, pomegranate seeds here because they're just amazing for women's, women's health. Um, this could be, you know, this could take a, a moment to put together, but think of it this way. You can have a meat from leftovers from the day before, from, from your dinner before, right? Avocado is easy to scoop out, so you're not really cooking anything. To put your greens together, it doesn't take much effort. Sauerkraut all comes from a jar, right? So you just dish it out. So really, it's just the patties that take a moment to make, but you can pre-make them ahead of time and um, and then just take them out, warm them up, um, or just have your you know protein from the dinner leftovers from the night before, like a piece of chicken or a piece of you know whatever fish that you you had. Um, another example I want to show you is the fisherman's breakfast. So this is just a gluten-free toast with avocado. Um, having some smoked salmon, or you can just cook up a salmon and put it on top. 
and then a bit of sauerkraut um, and sprouts, broccoli sprouts on top. So those are just, you know, some of the ideas that I'm just giving you here. They're really straightforward. A lot of times, you know, I just eat my dinner leftovers uh, because that is just, um, just super simple and easy for me, especially my mornings tend to be busy because I feel the sharpest in the mornings and I get a lot more things done versus in the afternoons or the evenings. And so that's why I don't want to use up too much time in cooking breakfast during the week. Um, and I do that. And in order to not cook, I just use my dinner leftovers from the night before. Uh, Mel is asking, when do eggs make me feel tired? Uh, there's a possibility that you are having a food intolerance towards eggs. This is the reason why both my cookbooks, um, Overcoming Estrogen Dominance, as well as my first cookbook, Cooking for Hormone Balance, are based on the elimination diet, which means that you are going to be avoiding for a period of two um, to four weeks, four weeks preferably, all the foods that are known to be potentially problematic. So that's gluten, dairy, eggs, soy, corn, nightshade vegetables, and and then you only incorporate those back one by one in the challenge phase and then see what works and what doesn't. And Mel, what I would suggest for you to do is I highly recommend for you to try the elimination diet and cut out the eggs um, and then start incorporating in the challenge phase. And I explain in the book how to do that, incorporate them one after another every three, four days, and you will see whether eggs are your friend or your foe. Um, as you repair, as you fix your digestion, there is a possibility that you might be able to incorporate eggs back into your diet on an um, occasional basis. So like eggs have always been my problem in the past. And what um, and after I, I really spent a lot of time repairing my digestion, um, you know, I can have two to four eggs a week and I don't react to them if I had them every day. My issue is that I start having really dry skin and I start getting pimples on my face. Um, Veronica is asking, can you recommend a good brand of gluten-free bread, free from yeast, etc.? Yeah, so there is a lot of junky, that's a good question, Veronica, because there's a lot of really junky gluten-free breads, you know, breads like, uh, brands like Udi's and, uh, what's the other one, Glutino is just, to me, that's just a utter junk food. Um, one of the ways you know that if, that, that bread is pretty, uh, poor qualities is really light in weight. And so when you pick it up, it's like, it's like, like air, right? And that just tells you that it's devoid of any fiber. It just uses a lot of starches, starches turn into um, sugar really quickly. So it's another way of just giving yourself a hypoglycemic reaction first thing in the morning. We don't want that. So, you know, I think the, I don't think there's any global, um, oh, sorry, national brand that sells really high quality gluten-free breads, to be perfectly honest with you. But what I have found is every health food store sort of has their own regional brands. And you, know, you just have to go and, and look at the amount of fiber that it contains, that the first ingredients will actually tell you things like rice flour or brown rice, rice flour, you know, or sorghum flour or buckwheat flour or whatever. Um, those are some of the things to look for and not having like, if you look at Glutina or Udi's, they'll have things like tapioca, potato uh, flour, they call it flour, but it's really starch. Um, and that's the reason why they raise your blood sugar levels so quickly. Um, the other thing, Veronica, to do, depending on where you live, is that there's more and more bakeries that begin to uh, bake gluten-free breads. And so those are typically, I find, to be very high quality. We have a really great uh, bakery here in Boulder that does gluten-free breads. And so I get mine there. Um, yeah. Um, okay. If, if food for, yeah. So uh, Sasha is saying food for life brand. Yeah, that's a, you know, I used to actually buy that brand. And one, what I have noticed is that because I, I kind of, you know, I have telegraphic memory. So I remember all the ingredients that are there and their fiber had gone from like eight grams, they're just down to like two grams now. So they, they, they're, they're reformulating things and it's getting worse and worse. So I actually, I personally don't buy Food for Life um, anymore. I just get the, um, in Boulder, we have a bakery called Moxie and they have a gluten-free bread. That's where I get mine from. I just make my own. <clears throat> one, one bread that is, uh, I'm wondering how many of you here have tried it, is our, <clears throat> excuse me, Polish, it's a Polish sourdough bread, and don't let it intimidate you. Um, it's right here, and it's really nice and dense. It's uh, very rich, super healthy. All it just requires is um, is buckwheat, and you don't need a starter for to to ferment this bread. It's gonna 
it is just a totally different um, system. And so it's just a lot easier um, to do that. Okay. I'm just going to read out this one comment, Jolene saying, also, I'm really starting to believe that blood sugar diet are real. I noticed huge difference with eliminating, eliminating foods, even though supposed to be healthy, like oranges and chickpeas, but avoiding them with all A positive, um, the other A positive avoid foods, I feel better. I don't know what A positive uh, means, but anyway, I'm glad things are, something is working for you. All right, let's let's um, let's go on to um, the other aspect, and that is I want to talk about coffee and hydration. Those are really two big aspects. So one of the things, you know, that is uh, not going to be very popular is when I say that coffee actually zaps your energy levels. Um, it gives you the initial boost of energy, but after that, many of you might feel that after maybe three, four hours, uh, your energy levels are kind of like, boof. Like they, so the way coffee works is if I was to chart it out is that your energy levels go up, but they very quickly come down too. And when you, they come down, um, coffee also, by the way, raises your blood sugar levels. So it's very correlated with what I was saying earlier about you, how your blood sugar levels control your energy levels, right? And so you might feel like, you know, when you have that coffee down, right? how you know what how much energy you feel like you are missing and then what do you do then you drink more coffee um, and more put more sugar in it in order to to balance things out so um there's a couple of of options i have for you and i know it's not a very popular one because coffee really is a stimulant that so many of us are really so dependent on so i don't want to demonize it but there's a couple of considerations here if you really must drink coffee do drink it after a meal. Don't drink it on an empty stomach. On an empty stomach, it's like you're basically giving yourself a sugar spike right off the bat, right? Have it after a meal, then you're cushioning it off, hopefully with a PFF kind of breakfast. It's going to be your blood sugar levels are going to raise gently and you're not going to have that crush. Um, the other thing is to consider replacing coffee with something else that's also caffeinated. My personal favorite is matcha tea. Um, I, I like the one from uh, Pick Tea. That's my favorite. There's not a good one called Domacha. You can get it on Amazon, the organic version. Um, those are, you know, one teaspoon of matcha tea is equivalent of the amount of caffeine that espresso contains. So it's it's pretty caffeinated. The difference with um, something like this is that the uh, coffee, sorry, the um, um, matcha tea also contains L-theanine, and L-theanine is a calming agent. So the fact is that, you know, um, that matcha tea will help you to bring up your energy levels. And by the way, it happens like this. It's very slow and steady. And then the effect of it is, is that you slowly kind of wins yourself. It, it slowly kind of disappears in your body, if you will, without giving you that crush. So this is like one of my um, my one of my favorites. Chris is saying does coffee raise uh, cortisol levels? Yes, it does. Absolutely. And so one of the things that people who have... A HPA axis dysregulation should definitely not be uh, drinking coffee, and especially drinking coffee, like I said, on empty stomach. Just a really, really bad idea. Um, we have a great article uh, that talks about how to quit coffee. You know, one of the big benefits that our community has reported, apart from actually feeling more energetic from quitting caffeine or qu quitting coffee, and some some women, you know, energetically or intuitively feel that quitting coffee altogether is best thing for them. Others for whatever reason need like, okay, I need some caffeine in my life, right? And so they switch to something like black tea, green tea, matcha tea, white tea. White tea has got uh, the least amount of um, caffeine in it, you know, and they do really well. But overall, the response has been in our community who have been embarking on it is that they've got more energy, they have less sugar cravings, they start losing weight, they sleep a lot better, and the other thing, which is really interesting, is that hot flashes start going away, which I know many of you here are struggling with hot flashes. Um, and I have found the hot flashes are very tightly correlated with your blood sugar balance. And so when you fix your blood sugar balance, you can also fix your hot flashes and night sweats will go away. So, um, so Sheena is saying, I have only one cup of coffee on weekends because I have trouble sleeping at night when I do have it. I drink dandelion tea on weekends as herbal. Yeah, great, awesome. It's congratulations, and it takes some courage to give up coffee. I have to, I have to say, it's not the most the easiest thing to do. So um, the other thing is I want to share with you is hydration. So this is a really interesting one. You know, so many people actually go completely dehydrated, and I didn't really 
realize that until I actually I was in private practice and one of my uh, intake questions was how much water do you drink? And it was shocking to say like I've met women who are like full on with full on running around and doing things may have super active lives and they will have two cups of water a day. I was just like, ah, that's what I drink in the morning alone. How can you live on that? And so oftentimes we don't make the connection between dehydration and exhaustion. So how many of you here feel that you have um, actually had more energy, like when you have a glass of water and like you just like you have this expansive energy, like you've got like, the, it's like a real nice kick. Um, I certainly do when I'm dehydrated. And so a couple of things here. How much do you know um, to to drink in order to stay hydrated? So the amount matters. And just the, you know, the the proverbial or the uh you know, the, the recommendation is like a run of the mill of, of two quarts of water a day. Um, that's not really accurate. It really is connected to your weight, uh, to your body weight. So the old one was saying, take um, your body weight in pounds and turn that into ounces, half of that in ounces. I find that half of it is not enough. So you're going to do two thirds of your body weight. So let's just say that you're 150 pounds. So that means that you should be aiming for 100 ounces of water per day, even more so when you're exercising and when it's summer and you're profusely um, sweating. So that is equivalent for those of you who are in Canada or Europe. I know these ounces, pounds thing can be confusing. So there's basically 150 pounds. So you're at about 70 kilos. Then that equates to 12 glasses of water per day. So if you turn that into liters, there's actually three liters of water, or three quarts of water. So there's actually a lot more than um than what you you know than what we are told that two is enough right um the other thing is you want to want to consider especially I'm, I'm recording this during summer one thing that's really really important is for you to add um add some electrolytes into your water especially in when you're sweating when you're exercising they will give you another boost of energy i've learned it the hard way i was in sicily i went climbing this volcano and I didn't realize that in Italy, when they give you, they say three hours, it's actually three hours, not a round trip, but it's only to the top. And it's three hours for like a super athlete. So I took four hours to get to the top, another two hours to come down. By the time I came down, I was so severely dehydrated and I felt like my head was splitting open. I was drinking water and the more I was drinking, the more I was just peeing out. I felt like water was just, just running through me. Um, and I was meeting a friend that night for dinner and she is a big, she's a wine taster. She was in Sicily to buy wine. She's a wine buyer. And she's like, look, you know, I would love to treat you for this bottle of wine. And I'm like, look, that's the last thing I want to do right now is drink alcohol when I'm just barely standing here, uh, cohesive. And she said, and so the, the, the bar, uh, tender overheard it. And she said, Hey, let me make you a, a, a typical Sicilian uh, hydration drink. And so she basically put salt and lemon into my drink. And I had two of these and about 80% of my uh, headache went away. So that was a huge lesson for me on how in times of uh, dehydration and in order to stay hydrated, having electrolytes really can make a very big difference. Why? Because electrolytes, which is your uh, chloride, not chlorine, but chloride, um, your magnesium, your potassium actually helps you bring the, the water molecules into the cells. And so your whole body then that way feels hydrated. So to get that can make a very big difference. One thing is I, I hate electrolyte drinks because they're just loaded with sugar. Gatorade is like one of the worst things that you can buy. Most health food stores don't even sell Gatorade, but you can really do it super, super cheaply. Um, so I want to just show you, we have a product, we have a couple of products actually. One is Mineral Restore, which is actually sea salt water that's super clean um, that I like to put this in my water. So this is this is what I'm drinking right now. It's super hot in Colorado. I just do a little splurge like that. And that's Mineral Restore um, that contains also a lot of trace minerals. If you see the um, stories of people who bought Mineral Restore from us, they always say that they feel super energized by it. And I certainly feel that too. The reason why my water has this color is because I've got um, our morning ritual in here. And morning ritual is another one that I call it morning ritual because I always felt that whenever I do electrolytes first thing in the morning, I feel uh, very energized too. And so besides the electrolytes, it also has vitamin C. Uh, we've got magnesium malate and uh, absorbate. So also chloride sodium. So that's your potassium, that's your electrolytes. Um, it's got also taurine and quercetin and rutin. So 
a really nice and it tastes really really good so another cool product to um to incorporate to your your daily routine and but really like if you're going exercising like i like to jump on my peloton during the week when i don't have uh too much time to exercise outdoors then i just put in the drops a couple of drops of mineral restore into my water and i feel a lot more hydrated that way um as compared to just drinking plain water Okay, so hydration was one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about herbs. And, you know, I have found that, um, and I will say this with, you know, I'm, look, I'm an herbalist, right? So, you know, I belong to a number of different herbal uh, groups uh, online. And obviously I have a lot of friends who are herbalists. And one of the things that I really dislike is when herbalists or just generally us as, as users of herbs Think of replacing herbs instead of like we treating herbs like like the way we treat prescription drugs. Meaning, I've got a headache, I take a pill. I don't want to get pregnant, I get a take a pill. I can't sleep, I take a pill. Right. So it's kind of like instead of uh, using a prescription drug, we kind of replacing that with an herb here every time. And I don't like that because it's not really, it doesn't really work, and it's not fair of the herb to give you the kind of results you want. So like, for example, rhodiola is one of the, you know, very well-known Siberian um, herbs that can give you like real longevity and strength and force and, and all that. Great. But here's the thing. If you were, if you let's just like had five cups of coffee, if you just like started off your days with a lot of sugar, if you haven't slept the night before, right? You know, it's like, it's so unfair to be asking rhodiola just to give you like this boost of energy and keep you going for, throughout the whole day while you stuffed it up right from the from the get-go, right? So I see herbs as as a really wonderful addition to your protocol when you fix your breakfast, reduce your coffee, have your coffee after a meal, have a really nice PFF breakfast or just do fasting. Um, by the way, for women who fast, I you need to find out find it out for yourself. But I have found that if I do fasting and I have coffee even the one that was is recommended with a lot of butter and you know and that kind of um, protocols it just kills me uh 10 o'clock and i'm like completely brain dead i'm totally hungry i want sugar i can't think straight it's just pathetic so back to herbs um you know we want herbs to be as an addition to a really nice diet and that that way they work wonders they just they just really come to life when your body's able to receive them and and use them and that way you really honor their presence by giving them like you know a real good um start right to to function in your body so a couple of our favorite ones are rhodiola um the other one is ashwagandha although ashwagandha for some people can be um actually put you to kind of to sleep and so you kind of have to figure it out yourself um, and the um, and lastly is maca. Maca is also a really great one for helping you with balancing your estrogen levels. So one of the we always get asked about our adrenal TLC. So this is our our product called Adrenal TLC, um, and so it does contain um, rhodiola. It's got vitamin C in it too, B6, which is all. We also have urethro in it, uh, which is your Siberian ginseng. It's got American ginseng, ashwagandha, rhodiola, and uh, and look a, a tiny bit of licorice. So a really nice formulation. Again, if you're adding that to your really nice clean diet, reduce your coffee, get some good quality sleep. I mean, that's when you really feel the power of the herbs uh, working. Does that make sense? Like what I'm what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Um, so let's take a look at, let's see, what else do we have for today? A um, couple of supplements that can really make a difference. Again, these supplements will make a big difference when you combine it with a really nice clean diet. So my two favorites are um, going to be Mag Energy and B, B Maximus. Those are the two supplements we have. This Mag Energy um, is magnesium malate form. Malate is highly energizing for a lot of people, not for everyone. And that's why we call it Mag Energy. Please don't take it at night because you might end up being awake up till four o'clock in the morning. I've learned it a hard way, couldn't sleep for days. And then only then those years ago before I, I knew more about magnesium. And um, and then our formulator was like, oh wait, you're not taking mag malate, are you? It's like, yes, I was. Uh, that's what kept me awake. And I was like, I could do crossword puzzles at three o'clock in the morning. That's how awake I was. Uh, but if you take it in the morning, it gives you a really nice boost of energy without the jitters of caffeine 
And then we have B maximus. A lot of you know and you feel like when you take B vitamins at night, you can't sleep. So this is definitely your morning, uh, part of your morning ritual. And um, if you want to support us, I truly appreciate that. If you have your favorite brand of supplements, make sure that your B vitamins are methylated, especially B12 is in a cobalamin uh, methylated form and not cyanocobalamin um, because that is, um, is is basically a very cheap and uh, ineffective and actually dangerous uh, form of vitamin B12. So um, let me go over to, let's see what else do we have on the supplements. I think that's, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much what we have for you today. So when you, um, Tia is asking, can you take radiola, ashwagandha, and maca together? Yes, you can. The Tia, what I would say, I generally prefer to, especially if somebody is sensitive, um, it's better to start incorporating one after the other and then see what kind of works for you. Uh, because if it's, for example, making you tired, then maybe it's because ashwagandha is actually making you sleepy uh, rather than energizing you. So you're going to be, um, you just, you know, I, I prefer if you do that separately. Uh, Liliana is saying, so what book would you recommend for me? I've, um, I've need to change definitely my lifestyle. I do need to balance hormones as I feel my body is changing. I'm very active. I'm still, still don't eat dirty foods, but definitely want to pay attention and prepare my body for changes in the future. I'm 46. I know I do need to supplement, but I don't know where to start and what does my body need. Uh, thanks for all your wisdom. So Liliana, thank you for your question. It all depends on what are you going through? Like, what are you you know, what are you experiencing? Um, we have a lot of information on our website, hormonesbalance.com. So spend some time on it. Um, you know, I would say that like a baseline supplement, yeah, that's something that is correlated with the fact that we just don't have those nutrients in our food chain anymore. Um, because, you know, back in the day when we were farming, we were use farmers were using things like fish, fish meal and bone meal. And so a lot of the calcium, magnesium, boron, like all those things that make up um, bones, which is, by the way, a lot more than just calcium, um, get got back into the soil. And then the soil was then obviously um, the food was absorbing that from the soil. And so food used to be a lot more nutritious. We don't have that anymore. And even organic farming is kind of like mass farming without the pesticides. So it's not particularly most nutritious. Uh, form of um, food, unfortunately. So this is the reason why, you know, I will tell you, like as a budding practitioner, when I first started out, I was so staunchly convinced that I was so such a believer that doing only food and getting all your nutrients from food, that was the way to go. And then I started having, you know, like um, cold sores that are showing up and my tongue was swell up. And then my fingers were still like, you know, I have uh, white spots on my fingers, which is your zinc deficiency. Like if you have white spots on your on your fingers, right, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know my immune system wasn't wasn't what it, what I wanted it to be. Um, and so it became really clear that. And the minute I started taking supplements, I started feeling a lot better. And so, you know, it's um, so it's I would say the baseline that's missing in food today. You just can't go wrong with is and this things that I take on a daily basis is number one, magnesium, which I feel like is the biggest one. And um, look at our magnesium recipes, Liliana, because there is a way to dose up to know what is your what is your dose. It all depends on how depleted you are. Like my dose is about 500 milligrams a day. Yours could be 2000 milligrams a day because you're depleted. And then you can back off by using your stool as the indicator of what is the when is the saturation point and you back off. So I would say that um, zinc, vitamin D3, um, you know, vitamin Bs, unless you can get access to liver and you like eating livers on a regular basis, um, that is, you know, that you don't need B vitamins. I don't have access to clean livers every time. And to be honest with you, I don't feel like eating them two times a week. So I just rely more on my B vitamin. Um, let's see what else. I mean, those are, I would say those are the baseline supplements, you know, that will be highly recommended. For, uh, other than that, you will have to poke around our website a little bit and see what else, um, what else um, speaks there to you. Uh, the different, different forms of magnesium are interesting but confusing. Which one do I need daily? Yeah, so it's, um, it's actually pretty straightforward. So Magnesium malate is what we recommend for um, in the mornings because it is an energizing form of magnesium. So magnesium malate is the form. 
Then you have magnesium um, in our store. I don't have it on the table here, but it's in our store. Magnesium replenish. It's in a magnesium. It's a magnesium in a glycinate form by glycinate. So it's a glycinic acid that's attached to the magnesium molecule. It's just as a carrier, and um, and that's a really great one for calming you, relaxing. It's not a sedative. It's not going to put you to sleep. It's just going to help you calm down and relax. And so. Um, you can look at that um, as a sort of an afternoon, evening magnesium. That's a magnesium I take before bedtime. And that way I have really great bowel movement and I sleep a lot deeper when I take this kind of magnesium. Um, and um, yeah, so then, and then magnesium citrate is a great one if you're chronically constipated before you resolve your constipation. By the way, there is a, take a look at my website, hormonesbalance.com. There is a seat, um, Magnesium rotation method that just explains these four different types. Citrate is more of um, it's more of um, of, a, of a, a per, it gives you a bit of a perch, so it's a laxative form. Um, that's why I don't like citrate on a regular basis. But if you're chronically constipated, I travel with citrate because I get constipated when I travel. So that's just a way, nice way of keeping things moving as you're on the road. Um, then you have magnesium in a form of Topical, so we have that in our store too. It's called quick magnesium. That's in a chlorine, a chloride form, and that's a really great one to bypass your digestion. Apply it on places that are like, you know, you have a restless leg or you have pain around your shoulders or cramps at night. That's a great one to apply. It works really quickly. 20 minutes, then wash it off. So those are the some of the things that um, you can do. The one form of magnesium that you want to avoid at all costs is magnesium oxide. It's the cheapest form of magnesium that it just doesn't do very much for you, very low bio bioavailability of actual um, elemental magnesium in it. And it's just companies that typically produce very cool, poor quality supplements would use magnesium oxide. So stay away from, um, stay away from that. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see this one here. My, uh, my daughter tried B-complex and reacted to the niacin with a, with a flush. Less niacin than uh, Willana. Should I try Willana? You can. Um, yes, you can. I mean, niacin typically would be part of most B vitamin complexes, you know. So, um, Shannon is saying, do you take K with vitamin D? Yes, you can. It helps with the absorption, it helps with bone building, K2, K3, K1, K2, sorry. Um, our vitamin D also contains uh, both of those Ks, and it's in a oil form, which is highest by availability. And vitamin D needs oil and fat in order to get absorbed. So if you're taking vitamin D in a pill form, uh, make sure that you use it in, um, it, you, you, you consume it with some kind of oil. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, have I answered most of the questions, Alexandra, or do I have, do we have anything else? Um, let me just read out this one, kind of going back to the energy one, because that's what we are here for. Uh, Lisa is saying, I was under a lot of stress taking care of my 85-year-old dad as he was dying of cancer, and I got a weird-looking rash on both arms at the same time that looks like little circles. So, you know, obviously I can't diagnose you here. You need to get proper diagnosis. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine last night, and she went through quite a lot of stress and ended up with shingles, you know, and that's your just classical suppressed immune system uh, situation. And, you know, it was really interesting for something that, um, you know, how many of you can relate to this when I say when you were, you went through like a really stressful time, like the way maybe Lisa has, right? You went through a stressful time. And then after that, like some kind of disease started manifesting, whether it's your immune system when you came down with a cold, something as benign as that, or, you know, you ended up with shingles or six months later, you found to have Hashimoto's disease, autoimmunity. It's really fascinating how your immune system, nervous system and the endocrine system are all actually connected. Women sometimes get stressed out. The period stops or the period is all over the place. And so the way this happens is actually in your, you know, one of the glands that is the, the, the bridge of all the three system is your... Um, is your hypothalamus. And so that's where all the systems meet. And it's no surprise, it's like your master controller where your immune system, your nervous system and your endocrine system all meet. And that's why they are so intimately all connected. Um, and to think that, you know, stress has got nothing to do with the immune system reaction that I had that are shingles that I had is very naive and very short-sighted. So be very mindful of that. 
Um, and um, uh, yeah, it is gonna, you know, and it's gonna help obviously your energy as well. Is it possible to send it to Europe? Uh, Theo is asking. So we don't ship to Europe. Um, customs is an absolute nightmare to ship uh, supplements internationally. So what you can do is you use a service called myus.com, so it's myus.com, and they you can buy a supplement from our store, ship it over there, they'll ship it to you. Typically, um, our European customers buy a larger quantity so that they don't pay for the shipping, they only pay for shipping once. Um, other than that, Theo, I would say, you know, find, based on what I'm sharing here with you today, find some clean, nice brands that are in Europe and that way you save on shipping. Um, let's see. Uh, mm, yeah, so I think we should be we should be good. Adam saying that's exactly what happened to me. I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'm assuming it was like something stressful and then a disease came on. I'll just say one more other uh, thing before we wrap up is that um, just sorry, it's just one second because I think I have. Um, Okay, yeah, I do have a meeting to go to. Um, one thing that I, I want to just share with you, when I was in private practice, we used to, I used to work with uh, my clients on doing uh, a health timeline. And what it was, it was basically writing out, and you can do this at home um, today, if you start doing this today, is draw a line from inception. So inception as in from the time your mom became pregnant with you, right? And whatever stuff your mom went through during pregnancy can make an impact. And then from the time you're born and then draw a timeline and start writing down some of the major events that happened in your life. You know, like um, maybe parents were getting divorced or moving countries or, you know, a parent passing away or taking care of a sick parent like the way um, Lisa just mentioned. And, you know, or having having um, a lost a job, losing a business, you know, whatever it might have been, right? So write down all the different events that happened and just uh, that the the uh, that, uh, the the um, that the date that it happened, right? Roughly month and year, and then what you do on the other half of the page, right? So you, the timeline is here. You're writing down all these events down below, and then you write on top. You can turn the page this way, so you can kind of see chronologically what's you know this are your events, and then the right side. Then you start writing, when did you start having some of the major health events happen? And it is very emotional for a lot of women to see how much it wasn't immediate, right? But like, for example, having, um, you know, a death in a family, like mom passing away at an early age and how, you know, a month later, two months later, you lose your period that didn't come back for a couple of years, right? Or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, there was a huge correlation between major life events um, and different changes, health changes that were taking place. And I remember so many women saying, for example, was a health health um, t caretaker for a very sick parent for a long time. And then Hashimoto's came on a year later. Um, my aunt, for example, lost her home in the fire in the middle of January in Poland. So super cold. They, they they ran out literally in their pajamas and nothing else, and they lost everything. And insurance won't reimburse them. They want receipts for all the things that they bought, which is just utter nonsense. Um, and so they've lost a lot, and they had to, you know, build, rebuild their home. They had to live in a, in a makeshift homes between my 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 dad, who was the brother, and and a couple of other places. And so it was super stressful, obviously. And my aunt was found to have breast cancer a year later. So. You know, obviously, it could be total correlate, it could be totally coincidental. Um, but having work that I, having done the work that I have in the past and the work that I do now, you know, I I wouldn't say that is completely not correlated to her developing breast cancer. Anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Um, if you missed the beginning part, I was talking about how my HRV heart rate availability went up when I was away and being out in nature and stuff. So. It's just proof is in a pudding, right? And so I wanted to show you my numbers. So on the Facebook page, you can see my HRV numbers before and after. So take a look at that. But I just want to encourage you um, on that note, go and hug a tree this weekend. Go and have a swim in some river or pond, the clean water. You know, go, go and call a girlfriend you really care about and have a good laugh. Watch a comedy. Um, you know, not some drama thing that makes you stressed out, just something that makes you really feel happy and fulfilled and um and you and you will that will just help you so tremendously with your immune system with your with your hormones and and that way inevitably um you are gonna be definitely enjoying better energy levels today since 
Um, and and this is gonna be the last question I'm gonna take. Anne is asking, what are you using for HRT? I'm using uh, my Aura Ring, but there's a lot of other devices that you can use. All right, thanks everybody for your great question and participation, and um, I will see you next week. Bye for now. <laughs>